This is the chance for our visitors to actually ask questions in a candid way, in a kind of an unscripted, unguided way. You can find out what the program's really like. Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Cooper, and um, I currently work as an engineer for Baxter Healthcare, and I've been in the program for about three years, and I'm just finishing up my last course, so I'll be done here in March. My name's David Zeman. I work actually in environmental finance at Wells Fargo, and I've been in the program since 2010 and have one more class left. Uh, my name's Brian Kieber. I'm a senior process engineer at Ingredion. Uh, it's a starch and sweetener manufacturer uh, on the south side, and I've been in the program since the late 2010, and this is it for me. So I've got four more weeks. I'm Brett Collins. I'm a test engineer with Navistar on Melrose Park. Um, I began the program January 2010, and I'll finish this June. For instance, you can take two classes out of Kellogg or any other school. So as your your schedule, you know, if you start to see a corridor where you know you may not have something that fits what you like, there are opportunities to look elsewhere for that. Um, how many hours outside of um, class did that require per? Um, if you just take one class a semester, so um, I. Uh, only am able to take one class a quarter. I travel a lot for work, so I haven't been able to take more than more than one. Um, it can range depending on the class. Um, you know, one class only four hours outside of class, up to you know ten. I would say would be kind of a range. It, it, it honestly depends on the class. More, I think more classes um, are a lot more group work, so you're meeting with um, team members, and that can take some more time. Uh, but one helpful tool that the university has is the uh, the the CTECs that are available through uh, the Caesar system. Um, as you get enrolled, there will be uh, a whole series of uh, feedback reports from all the students that have taken a given course over the last several years, um, and it includes estimates, uh, you know, average standard deviations for what the students claim they've spent, you know, in terms of outside of class time. It has those kinds of things. It has ratings um, with respect to any number of dimensions that have been defined for a particular class. So you can you can use that as kind of a planning tool to find out if you know if there are especially group work heavy courses um, that coordination with your team becomes kind of a a, a challenge. Um, so you want to try and get out ahead of those and, and plan for them. I guess not necessarily course related, but just time conscious. The program knows that most guys will be working full time. You don't have tons of time to spend on schoolwork or anything with your degree. So they try to eliminate a lot of the overhead stuff for you. So for example, registering for classes, things that was a pain, at least for me as an undergrad, the program takes care of for you. They'll send out the list, say, here's all the classes being offered this quarter, email me back, and then they'll do the rest for you. If anything else, administrative needs taken care of, even with graduation, Diane's taking care of all of our graduation stuff for us. So they, some of the stuff that would bog you down as an undergrad, they'll take care of for you in, with this program. That, that at least frees up your time, at least at the beginning and end of the quarters. And I'd add one comment. The People can get by with a less of a workload if you want, but you know a lot of the focus, obviously, is a professional education, is the more you put into it and the more you learn, the more you can apply back at work that will develop opportunities while you're a current student rather than you know waiting till the end of your degree to have the realization of that. The question is how visible are the professors and along with visibility I'd say every professor I've had is completely 100 percent accessible anytime. You can shoot them an email. A lot of them are, have you know significant travel schedules and anything like that but they're accessible and I'd say almost everyone also has a standing offer that any student can email them at any time for the rest of their career and, and ask questions or seek advice for anything. One thing as a lot of professors like to do is a nice day of class since you are meeting only one night a week, they'll typically show up half hour, hour early, or they'll stay late as well. So if you really want to do a face-to-face -face interaction, you know, it may be a challenge for you to get here at Northwestern at any time when you don't have classes, but at least you're coming on those days you do and they'll be available before or after class to meet with you face-to-face -face if that's what you need. And to plug one thing that just happened on Friday night this past week, one of the professors hosted about 50 students and other faculty members to his home for kind of an MEM networking event, which was the, the first of its kind and was a fantastic experience to mingle with your fellow classmates and professors in a relaxed environment. Um, 
are the professors accommodating, you know, when missing a, a class? I have missed many classes. I, I do travel um, quite a bit. So um, it is a challenge to balance. I always try to never miss more than one class a quarter. And I, I've made it work so far. Um, so that can be, you know, a challenge sometimes making sure, you know, with your balancing your travel schedules and things like that. But uh, the professors have been very accommodating. They realize that we're um, professional students, you know, still trying to maintain our full job. Um, so I haven't had any issues. Um, I know, you know, I, I still make sure that I, um, you know, classmates are willing to help and get notes and things like that. So I haven't had a bad experience with that. Everyone's been very helpful. Yeah, I, I would second that. I've had a couple of classes that I've had to miss over the last couple of years uh, for similar reasons. Um, as long as you're you're out in front of it, you give some warning to the professor that you're not going to be there. Stay current on your work, um, and it's not something that you know becomes a, a habitual kind of a thing. Uh, most most professors are understanding of the fact that you know this is a this is a, a secondary. Uh, pursuit for you. You do have a full-time job. Uh, I'll reverse it. Um, I, I've done very well at being able to make all the classes. I made it a priority. I also communicated that to my work, and so I've been able to reverse it and say, all right, I'll, I'm willing to travel, but granted, I have class. So, you know, this is something like I'm going out of the way to become a better employee, so cut me some slack here. And my, com my company, at least, has been fairly accommodating in that regards when I approached them about it. What uh, what portion of the curriculum uh, have we utilized most in our in our jobs? And with a lot of the work that I do, which is focused around uh, process improvement, um, I've utilized a lot of the risk analysis tools uh, and, and simulation tools that we've learned in um, a couple of the courses in, in quantitative decision tools and in computer simulation for risk and operations. Um, some of the optimization tools that are also then used in um, supply chain management. Uh, really the, the bases are uh, linear programming and um, then Monte Carlo simulation for a lot of the risk analysis. I do testing for a living so I took a class called Design for Six Sigma and we got really into advanced design of experience DOE analysis, how to handle multivariables um, with limited number of runs, realizing that cost is an issue. It's not, we know not long in academia, we know we can't do eight variables in 64 runs and figure out how everything works, how we take those eight variables, condense it down into maybe eight or 16 runs and get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, noise factors, everything, that. how does all that play in in the actual um, real world setting where there's money on the line? On the flip side of the slide, it's more of a technical side. I've actually applied a lot of the softer skill sides, um, taking like some negotiation courts, negotiation courses and leadership courses, and um, not saying there I stand up in the front of a room now and with a big like S on my chest like I'm a superhero, I'm the leader of the team, but just reading like there there is at least for me like learning that there is a science to leadership, there is a science like to social interaction. It's not just all fluffy rainbows and everything. There is actually like tools to learn and you can apply, and it's it's very subtle in your in my work experience, but. I know it's just by knowing those things in the back of my mind, I've gained more confidence and I've, I've been able to actually reflect back on them and like realize I've used them without even knowing it at the moment. And that's, that's been very rewarding for me. The great thing about the MEM program is there's different aspects to management. There's people management, there's technical management, project management. And the MEM program, I think, gives you a wide range of all those different aspects. And so I've taken key things from you know, the people management, whether it's the soft skill piece of it, um, project management, and still having technical courses, like Brett said, with um, Six Sigma and things like that. So I would say I've taken a bits and pieces from each of those aspects and applied them to work and continue to once I graduate. I think one extra th thing to mention is that once you become sort of a part-time night student, it really by nature of what it does to you makes you get more efficient at your time management and allocating your own resources and that applies itself into the the workforce and I think that often gets noticed by management you know that you're capable of of managing multiple different things and then delivering that within the company um, I live on the western suburbs so I've taken and work out western suburbs so I've taken about half my classes out in Bensonville 
and so that's been very convenient for me. Um, the one chance, the one difficulty with Bensonville is they only offer one course a quarter. I don't even know if they offer one in the summer, um, and it's usually a core course. So what I did, you talk about um, setting up your schedule, was I kind of laid out my two-year plan, and I didn't have it set in stone, but I had, I kind of want to maybe take these classes here, these classes there, but I really tried to cater. So all my core courses, for the most part, were out at Bensonville, so that worked for me a lot. Um, I also took a class down um, downtown, but that was a Kellogg class. I think all the MEM classes are either here or in Bensonville. And the downtown class, it was fine. Um, you're going to be with, uh, the class size is probably going to be bigger, and you're going to be with all Kellogg students, so you're probably not going to, at least for me, I didn't fit in as well. I still enjoyed the class. It was, it was one of the better classes I took. Um, it was a bridge between MEM and Kellogg, but it was just it was a different environment. So there I took the train downtown. The, if you guys aren't familiar with the downtown campus, it's by Northwestern Hospital. Driving's a pain. Parking's like 30 bucks, whatever. So just, just take take the train, and it, and it worked out fine. Um, I've, I've done about 50-50. 50 of my courses at Bensonville and 50 um, here in Evanston. I live way up north, so not even close. So it's like an hour and a half drive for me to Evanston. So personally, I like Bensonville better. Sir, how big is the typical class size? Um, so currently right now, I'm in the largest class I've ever had, which is McNeely's um, capstone course, which is 30. That's, that's huge. None of the courses I've ever taken have been that big before. Usually they're, you know, around the smaller end, you know, 15. Yeah, I guess um, a lot of the core courses that you take, uh, so the, the six core classes have a tendency to be be larger courses, can have upwards of 20. Um, some of the classes that I've taken that are more focused and are elective-based, um, it could be 10, a dozen, you know, maybe 15. So the question was, would if you could go back in time, would you rather do the full-time program or the part-time? Um, I would say I'd stick with the part-time hands down. I mean, for me, I've, I've doubled up some courses. I think I've doubled up three or four times. So you, if you do want to escalate or accelerate the program, you can. So typically it's a three-year program. I'm doing it in just over two. It is manageable and doable if you pair the right classes together. I think one of the nice things about going part-time is you get to apply the skills as you go. So you actually get to like you're only focused on one class or maybe two classes at most, and you, you kind of get more involved, and then you can work on applying those skills to your career um, and then go to the next one and apply it instead of being bombarded with skill set all at once and then try to take that year and then apply everything all at once in a new job. Um, to me, that means a little bit more challenging. Also, I guess for me, from the financial reasons, you know, if you can make it work, why not get paid and, and go to school at the same time? The biggest thing that I've gotten out of um, doing it part time is just the experiences with other people in the professional industry. Um, I've I've gained a huge network from people with other aspects, different careers, how their businesses are set up, and so I've really enjoyed doing it part time. And and a lot of the people you know within the program are part time, and so we've been able to gain knowledge from different things we apply on the you know in the class to our daily jobs. So I think that's been very helpful. Part of the whole learning experience here is that everyone brings their own experiences with them. You all bring experience prior to now, and then um, ideally, as you progress, you apply certain things, you bring more and more educational opportunities to everyone else in the group as well. So I'm, I've always been really partial to the, the part-time. Okay, so the question is, uh, when is there a, when have we had for each of us, when have we had a work experience uh, that is translated to uh, to class to coursework? Um, and I can share an example from last quarter. Um, I was uh, in the process of putting together a, a major capital project plan uh, for a planned expansion and new product line um, that was going to. Uh, I guess there was significant. Uh, significant risk analysis implications in terms of product success, product failure. Um, I was in a finance course last quarter uh, where we used some of the traditional engineering economics tools um, that, that you probably all had at some point as an undergrad, uh, but then applied uh, Monte Carlo simulation for risk analysis to those, um, as well as uh, using decision trees for um, uh, for options valuation. 
So we took a couple of those components and I was able to use uh, my, my real project and put together uh, with my costing information um, and my, my product plan and put together a, a, a really robust risk analysis uh, to present for, for approval. Um, and that's what you it was actually, it was my final project as well for the course. So I did my final project and it was something that I could, that I could apply really well. Um, what you'll find, I think, in, in a lot of classes, uh, professors try to create assignments that will tie in things that, that you can bring your experience to bear, but things that you can also take back a, maybe a superior product to your company. And there are, I, would, I would also mention the finance class, which was relevant to me at work, but there are other classes like technical entrepreneurship or product development. And I'd say a few more where you have the opportunity, it may be a group assignment, but if you have a good project at your employer and assuming your employer is comfortable with you introducing a, a few other students to that, you can bring that into the classroom. You can get professor advice. Um, Brian mentioned the computer simulation course. I took that with him. The, Professor Nelson is a simulation expert, department chair of the whole industrial engineering department here. So if you had anything you wanted to bring in for him to look at, debug, give, give his thoughts, you know, you have access to those resources and more. A, a lifetime commitment too, right? Yeah, lifetime <laughs> commitment for those. As long as it takes him less than an hour or two, yeah. I think he'll, he'll do it for free. Otherwise, you're doing a consulting fee. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I haven't utilized this, but I know it's been offered where you know, if, if you have a project at work and it's something that a few undergraduate students or a PhD student might be interested in taking on a, you know, a longer term look at that, you can potentially bring that back to your company and even have some free educated and skilled labor. Uh, the question is, uh, what, what type of student would want to focus on uh, the combined, the triple M program uh, versus one or the other? at least from my perspective, it all depends on what you're trying to do with, with the degree. Um, I have a, a very clear technical slant and that's where I see myself taking my career um, by spending extra time taking more traditional management courses. I don't think I put myself in a better position to do those things. Um, so the, the MEM program really appealed to, to what I specifically needed. Uh, because I could take my, my management core and then round out my experience with some really in-depth technical electives. Um, I you guys may, may have a, a different perspective. Yeah, I, I think that's my perspective as well. I honestly don't know as much about the, um, the Triple M program. And maybe if you wanted to focus in some area, you know, outside, you know, if you wanted to get maybe into more marketing or, or you know, things like that. Maybe the MBA might help you with that. Um, I'm not sure, but for myself as well, the MEM was my only option. That was the only thing that I wanted to do, so. And I found the MEM program by investigating the MMM program. And I personally, like some of us talked about, I wanted to go to school part-time. I didn't want to make the full-time commitment and take on the debt burden and all that. So that, you know, the MEM to me, even on a part-time basis for, versus the MBA, had the electives I wanted in the format that I wanted, and it, it seemed to align most with my goals and what I wanted in a professional education. And I actually know, uh, I think two people that had to take the statistics class prior to entering, and I think one more that took it just to refresh himself. Uh, Diane or Sue, who you've probably communicated with before, they can give you a whole list of you know what schools they'll take it from, and, you know, it, I wouldn't be intimidated by it at all, you know, you sort of, it's just calc-based statistics. It's, it's really not, uh, you know, something overly challenging. And the use of it within the classroom, you have to know some of it. But, again, you know, if you, if you got a B in it or something, it's not going to prevent you from doing just fine in any course you'll take. I guess the question was, did you take the GMAT before applying? I took the GMAP. I was looking for like a a, a more traditional technical masters. For for this, it wasn't necessary. The question was, what are the admissions criteria? Um, the only firm criteria that I know of um, is that you need to have three years of professional experience. 
Um, and that gets to kind of what we discussed with uh, a lot of the learning opportunities that everyone gets are from those sitting around the room uh, around them. Um, the academic requirements from you know an undergraduate standpoint, um, I don't I don't believe there's a necessarily a, a firm line as far as uh, you know GPA requirement or anything. Um, I know they're they're stringent, but uh, uh, there's nothing published. I think for a differentiation, a lot of emphasis goes on your resume, what your work experience is, and then also your letters of recommendation backing up what you're actually saying that you've done.